Good morning and welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Dr. Priscilla Maria Page. I am honored to share the stage with our guests today. I am honored to be one of the conveners, a member of the National Organizing Committee for this uh, auspicious gathering. It's my heart is so full, my mind is so full, uh, my spirit is so full, and so um, just happy to be here. I'd like to make one um, announcement, and folks have heard this last night, but I'm going to keep saying it, is that we're creating a um, collaborative timeline of theatrical jazz, and so the invitation is for you to grab a post-it note, a sticky note, uh, some paper, some stickers, some yarn, write in your names, write in your people you've collaborated with, productions you've been a part of or witnessed, um, but help us to build that timeline um, uh, this weekend as we're all gathered together. Um, I'm going to share some brief introductions of our panelists in the interest of time because I want us to um, jump into the conversations this morning. Um, the full bios are both um, online in the digital program that's housed on the link tree in uh, the Pillsbury House and Theater um, site. And for those of you who are live streaming through HowlRound, the full bios are also on the front page where you logged in to to stream with us this morning. So I'll be brief in my introductions and then it will be expansive in our conversation this morning. Um, I'd like to start to my far left with Alexis Pauline Gums, who is cherished by a wide range of communities as an oracle and vessel of love. Drawing on over 25 years of experience as a writer and facilitator, her inclusive practice finds us and brings us into the ceremonies we have always needed. Among her many publications, which are too many to list this morning, um, I think I'll make note of her most recent, um, which is her new biography, Survival is a Promise, The Eternal Life of Audre Lorde. I believe that is out or coming out very soon. August 20th, thank you. <laughs> To my immediate left, Megan Monahan Rivas is a theater artist, educator, and academic leader, and she is currently the artistic director of Connecticut Repertory Theater and the department head of dramatic arts at the University of Connecticut. She pr previously served as the interim head of the School of Drama at Carnegie Mellon University, where she was a member of the faculty starting in 2013. And among her many accomplishments, what I'd like to note most relevant to today's conversation is her work at Frontera at Hyde Park Theater in Austin, Texas. And so as we talk about theatrical jazz and the important work um, and really uh, some of the important roots of this work, um, that's where Megan's contributions will be very important today. Um, two seats over to my left is Talvin Wilkes, playwright, director, and dramaturg, another person with a tremendous list of collaborations and achievements and awards. Um, his artistic practice spans theater, dance, poetry, and performance. Um, again, the full list is online, and you can find that and read all about him. He is also an associate professor here in the theater arts and dance department at the University of Minnesota. And most relevant to today's conversation um, it, that I'll be asking him to speak about um, are his collaborations with poet and playwright and performer Sekou Sundiata and Craig Harris. Um, and Talvin was the researcher, co-curator, and dramaturg for the Sekou Sundiata retrospective, which was titled Blink Your Eyes. And it took place in various locations in New York City from April through October of 2013. Um, and I was making a joke uh, just before we started. I've got my emotional support books here. And the, the Blink Your Eyes retrospective book is among those that I brought today. Um, so maybe we'll be able to talk. And <laughs> He brought it too. <laughs> so those are my um, introductions. I um, was so moved last night at our welcome and invocation, um, listening to Signe and to Jola and to Marvin K. White as they um, asked us to breathe together and to contemplate our ancestors and to think about and acknowledge the folks who we bring in the room with us. Um, this very powerful and meaningful. And so um, 
in terms of storytelling, I'm going to start with a, a brief story um, that I'd like to share, if I can open my book correctly. Um, so I want to name uh, my mother, Patricia Louise Chavrin Page, and I want to share with you all that I earned my PhD in 2018 and that I just received the news this week on Monday that I am now an associate professor, a tenured professor at the <laughs> University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's been a, a long time coming and a long story for another day. But I share these things to say um, that when I walk into the classrooms and when I walk into academic spaces um, at my home institution, I have taken up the practice of asking to be called Dr. Page, Prof. Page, Dr. P. Um, and that comes from both sort of a sense of myself, right, and a claiming of this, um, and an acknowledgement of my mother who in her life uh, she was one of nine children. She is, was of Mexican and um, indigenous heritage and mostly raised by her single mother, Lila Chavrin, in Oakland, California. And among some of the challenges, they were economically ch there were economic challenges in that they shared shoes and sweaters and coats. There wasn't enough money to buy things for all nine children. Um, by the sixth grade, my mother decided that she didn't want to go to school, and she shared with me because she couldn't participate in the ritual of getting new school clothes every year, and she was quite embarrassed to not have new clothes like her peers would have. So she stopped going to school in the sixth grade. And so as I move through academic spaces, it's important for me, <laughs> I'm going to tear up a little bit, um, I'm bringing my mother, Patricia Louise Page, with me every time I step into these spaces. And that's important to me. Thank you. Um, so that's the story. I'm going to turn another page here. Um, and I'm going to share then also another uh, story of mine that's equally important, which is that in terms of my artistic life and my creative work, um, that I was invited by Talvin Wilkes in 2003. He was the interim artistic director of New World Theater, and he invited Lori Carlos and Marlise Yearby to bring their women project to Amherst College. And that was an incredibly transformational time. Um, it was a time, unlike the academic spaces I have been and continue to be moving through, it was a space where I felt seen. I felt um, that people with shared experiences, perspectives, values, um, all of these things came together in that project. And working with um, Marlise and Lori for that week and having that culminate in a performance where we generated our own original work, um, many of the lessons, many of the values, many of the ways of making work uh, collaboratively um, still hold today uh, for me in my approach to both teaching theater and to making theater. And so I think that this is the focus for us, um, is that I'd love to hear a story from each of you that maybe can illustrate or share or bring us into how you might interact with some of the um, precepts of theatrical jazz, how you may have collaborated with some of the folks we're naming specifically this weekend, um, Sekou Sandiata, Entezaki Shange, Lori Carlos, Shea Youngblood, who we must also acknowledge has just um, transitioned. Um, and anybody can start anywhere. And I think maybe a short story that could then lead us into more of a conversation. Um, we have two mics to share between the four of us, and you can, they'll just turn them on for us. Well, since I have it, I'll start. There you go. And I'll, I'll follow, you know, I'll follow through from uh, your prompt, Priscilla, because the, the story that I wanted to tell really was from an experience from just last fr Friday. And it's really about the liveness of this conversation that we're having and this understanding of this engagement with uh, theatrical jazz and this sense of aesthetic and this idea of invocation. Um, and so I've recently been involved in the development of a new world premiere, uh, new world premiere, redundant, a uh, world premiere of a work by Jawale Zoller and Urban Bush Women called Scat. And it's about to premiere in a couple of weeks at Bard Summerscape. Um, and it's a major collaboration with Craig Harris, and it is this long time 
collaboration from their early work of heat and the long journey that they've had together and the spirit of practice and invocation inside of the actual work itself. Um, and so last Friday, I was inside of this moment where we had just done a presentation and we were having this post conversation with the audience and Craig Harris just started preaching. And he just started calling names. And he just started saying, well, this is, you know, we do what we do. And this is what we've been doing all along. And he started calling. And Mary Lou is here. And Jimmy Lunsford is here. And Sun Ra is here. And the spirit of our embodied practice and our language. And you know, Jawale, this is where we've been. This is where we live. This is where we be. This is all about the work. And the whole week of process had really been about uh, invoking names connected to engaged practice, that the languaging and the spirit of voice to just say, to bring Lori's name inside of the room, to bring Ro uh, Robbie's name inside of the room, was a direct uh, translational uh, vocabulary with the ensemble, with the dancers, with the singers. And so for me, I just wanted to share the, the liveness and the immediacy of all that we are discussing and thinking about this as practice coming from uh, the invocation that we received last night and connecting to the idea of invoking name inside of process that links and brings us uh, to this connected place of creation. Mm -hmm. um, so just to say that um, the framing and the understanding and the guidance that we are receiving um, is flowing through me at present. <laughs> wow, 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 yes. So, when I was 14 years old, I was part of a young women's writers group at the longest lasting feminist bookstore in North America, Karis Books in Atlanta, Georgia. And Shay Youngblood came and she did a workshop with us. We prepared for her visit. We all read Black Girl in Paris. And it's a moment that I think you've probably had a moment like this where it so blew my mind and my sense of possibility that when I try to go back in my memory to the moment itself, it's like I can only see the edges of my former self scattered around, you know, like scattered around the, the space. But Shay Youngblood's intervention was about so many things. It was about a black girl can go to Paris. It was about someone who is, someone who says yes to their hunger for life can express that in any form. And because I stayed with Shay's work, I learned that we find our family. That the universe places people in our lives so that we can decide to be mothered by them. They all have stories and gifts to offer us. And so it's the combination of that actual, the actual person Shay Youngblood and her family, which is this family among many families that she has. And that approach that I, from that moment on, was always looking. I was always looking. And I was seeing aspects of myself that I was afraid to claim. And I would see them in other people and allow myself to be taught by them. Even people who to this day, I have no idea who I am. You know, I was just like, but I know that I'm a part of that person and I can watch. And so maybe that, that leads to the scholarly impulse and the dramaturgical uh, miracle, which 
is once again a thing of saying yes, not knowing what I'm saying yes to, saying yes to Sharon, saying yes to Ebony, saying yes to Daniel. And um, I'll just say that my story is that story of a 14-year-old who got to meet Shay Youngblood and I'm really honored to be here in this moment. Thank you. I think the most salient part of my history is the one that Dr. Page named, that from 1995 to 1998, I served Frontera at Hyde Park Theater as its literary manager and dramaturg. After completing my master's degree at the University of Texas at Austin, there's a, a running motif in the conversations in this conference so far about paying a lot of money for that degree. Uh, <laughs> I paid no money for that degree. I went where they paid me. But it landed me where I needed to be. In my grad program, I was profoundly unsatisfied. So I went looking and found an opportunity to volunteer with Frontera during my third year. I had begun to watch their work. I was magnetized to it, and so I started to offer to put some labor in, and they would list in their programs, we need uh, postage stamps and frequent flyer miles and a table saw, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we need people to read plays, ha. So I volunteered to read, and I read several plays every month, and I would share with the then literary manager my recommendation about what might move forward with the company. And time came around, and that person stepped away from that responsibility, so I, asked if I could step in, and I was invited through the door, which made all the difference. Those four years and the people I worked with during that time became the constellation of stars I steer by. Some of those folks are in this room physically. All of those folks are in this room. During that time, I absorbed practices that you know, now I identify as an educator. For the last 15 years, most of what I have done is in service of the development of the next generation of artists. I want to change the field in a generation. Theatrical jazz doesn't just make art. Theatrical jazz makes artists. So where the theatrical jazz practices that we're in conversation about and in conversation with during this time together have showed up in my classrooms and in the communities that I serve, uh, whether that community is as small as one person drinking tea with me in my office or as large as a whole school full of different learners and different teachers and different art makers. So I'm here in a spirit of great gratitude to have had the chance to spend that time being introduced to and challenged by those practices so that all these years later, they can serve, in a unique way, a new group of people. Thank you for each of that. Um, and what I was observing in terms of this panel, it's the dramaturgy panel, so we're all dram dramaturgs of sorts and work in our different ways. Um, we all have different histories, um, some of us leaning more towards literary management, new play development, devising, theater making, creative writing, playwriting. Um, and we also share um, collaborations with lots of folks in this room and at this conference. There's a lot of overlap, even if we have or haven't worked together. Um, and I'm wondering if um, we can uh, shift into sharing some specifics and if you can think of a particular production or a particular project or collaboration um, that you can bring us into a little bit, again, through a story, and that maybe while we're listening to the stories as a group, we can think about um, the precepts of theatrical jazz, and I rely heavily on, and I bring them with me, and it's here right now, Experiments in a Jazz Aesthetic. So Omi and Sharon and Lisa C. Moore's book, um, grad students uh, that I work with just this year, we've re read both of those together, um, which meant I got to reread them and fall in love all over again. Um, and from that, there are some ideas, right, that include um, the idea of presence, of breath, of deep listening, of improvisation, 
the holding of simultaneous truths, the idea of collaboration, virtuosity, and the acknowledgement, right, of the body as the site of knowledge. And so maybe as you're sharing an example, a story about a project or a collaboration, um, if you feel moved to name any of those as, as they may have been present, but also as we listen and maybe we can start to connect the threads um, as we move into this. And in terms of how the session will go, we'll open it up um, shortly, but I'd like to hear a few more stories and then we'll transition to some uh, questions and dialogue with the audience. But I'd love another round of stories of a, of a particular piece of work or project. And anybody can start. I'll start. Great. <laughs> um, and I'll just say for the, for the recording and for the archive, it's the other Lisa Moore who's co-editor of the oh, Experiments in a Jazz My aesthetic. apologies. Can you imagine having two Lisa Moores? Yes, in, Lisa in, L. In our Moore. Family? I'm yeah. so sorry. Lisa L. Moore. Yes. Um, Thank you. But it's because of Lisa C. Moore <laughs> who founded Fire and Ink yes. that I first got to see without introducing myself because I was really shy, Sharon Bridgeforth and Dr. Omi Oshun, Joni L. Jones, um, do something that I still can't describe, but that invited me, invited my partner, Shango Dare, into another stage of freedom. And so, OK, so this story is about when I had the great honor to be a dramaturg for the world premiere at Pillsbury House Theater yes. of That Black Mermaid Man Lady, the show. And it is, mm, mm. There are many stories I could tell. <laughs> Director Ebony Noel Golden <laughs> is already singing. Mm. Um, Makwe and Dosi, who created this incredible music. So we're gonna we're gonna get to experience so much with these folks that day. Um, but the story I'll tell is that I was locked out of Pillsbury House, and also my phone battery was dead, and also. I was supposed to be inside Pillsbury House <laughs> um, like 15 minutes before <laughs> this, this moment, at least 15 minutes before. And so many things were swirling around me in that time. I was here in Minneapolis as a visiting Winton chair at this institution. I felt, um, I felt like the door was locked also in that experience because we were invited by the incredible Zenzeli Isoke. She negotiated like the highest salary I ever got, ever. And um, this great programming budget. And I said yes to coming because I had come here and seen Sydney Herday and Shay Cage enact with the whole community, the black or the berry, on this stage. And I sat where you're sitting, and I was like, I would like to collaborate with these. What has happened in these artists in the Twin Cities? Like, I would like to collaborate with these artists. And then um, this university blocked and blocked and blocked and blocked every attempt to pay the artists, to feed the artists, to gather around food. To It, it, was, um, it was incredible to understand um, how scarcity and abundance um, were living for me in that moment. Also, I was in a state of trying to escape my grief. My father had passed away and I had never felt what I now understand is every single age of myself grieving in her own way, demanding to be listened to at the same time. And I was trying to pretend like that wasn't happening. And I was locked out of the Pillsbury House door. 
And I still have no idea. Sharon just came to the door and opened it. The thing had already started. You were like, I don't know. I just felt like I should come open the door. <laughs> and we went inside. And Ebony was having everybody move, but the specific language was this specific part of that Black Mermaid Man Lady. I wish I had one more moment with you. And for me, that was the actual door that I was locked outside of, that you opened because you are doing your own life work that for me gave me not just the permission but the mandate and the reminder and the supportive space to acknowledge that I had locked the door. By trying to shut the door on my grief, I shut the door on my ancestral connection I had shut the door on my joy. I had, and it didn't work. It's, not, it's like, you know, my ancestors are not like, they're not easy. They're like, we don't care. We will go under the door. <laughs> we, will, you know, we will flood the whole building. Um, we will, I, I mean, somehow I was here in the archive watching Conflama. The actual building was on fire. Like, there was a fire in the Givens archives while I was sitting in there watching Conflama and the whole building was evacuated. So, so um, I guess what I'm saying is I think this is true for all of us, but I know it's true for me that it's very dangerous to shut the door on the ancestral clarity, on the emotional reality, on what our grief is teaching us, what our love is teaching us, what our mentors are teaching us, and what I know is that the honor of being, I mean, thank goodness that I knew that there, the, the only definition of dramaturg I knew was an expansive definition of dramaturg that I had read about in a book called Theatrical Jazz. <laughs> um, and seeing like, oh, Dr. Omi, she made an altar. That, there was a meal, there, you know, like to see that what dramaturgs could do could be so expansive. Because what I know is that what, what it means to be present to the work and then collaborating on what makes it possible for everybody else involved in the work to be present to the world of the work is a sacred meeting point of the worlds that we need, that we're charged to create and we're like right outside the door. And so it's been a huge gift. The two times I've ever been a dramaturg, by the way, I was like, am I qualified to even be on this panel? <laughs> the two times I've ever been a dramaturg, <laughs> um, officially, were for That Black Mermaid Man Lady and then again at Pillsbury House for Bul the Bull Jean, um, Bull Jean, and then they back. Always, always come back. And what I know is that in order to receive the love that I think I'm not ready to receive, I have to become an expert in the work and worlds of Sharon Bridgeforth's art. <laughs> that, like that, that, that is a part, that's a part of my assignment. And I feel so grateful that what I think of as dramaturgy, accountability for the world, the world that the playwright is accountable to, the world that's possible through this work of art and the collaboration to bring it, to enliven it, is, it really comes through my own accountability to myself. And the rigor and the risk of that is that exactly the place that I want to deny myself, the world of love that I've always deserved. 
that's the place, that's the place that your work meets me. I'm always like, you know, sometimes I'm like, what is Sharon gonna write about next? Like, what am I denying? I don't even know that I'm denying it and I'm not gonna know until Sharon's like, I have a new, <laughs> I have a new show. Um, but I really invite, invite that challenge and the beautiful thing that I've experienced only having been a dramaturg in this particular setting and in this particular family is that it's a loving place for my entire sense of who I can be in the world and how the world can flow through me to change radically, sometimes in a very short time. So all that is to say thank you for opening the door. Um, when I thought about this, the thing that I wanted to share was really more of what I'll call an origin story. And the sort of the, 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 the opportunity and the grace that has guided me inside of this practice um, and has brought me to you know, a greater understanding as a director, as a dramaturg, engaged in collaboration with um, a lineage of incredible practitioners that I was inside of a practice before I had language for the practice mm -hmm. and an understanding of it. And just to acknowledge how grateful I am to uh, Om Yusun and the book and the languaging of a lineage and an affinity and uh, a travelogue and a collection of shared artistry and artists, um, especially at a particular time of my, uh, my own discovery and growth. Um, and so the story begins, you know, actually a quick, I'm going to do a quick timeline. Story begins, uh, age 16, I travel to New York City and I see For Color Girls on Broadway and am suddenly uh, just liberated from a particular understanding of what theater is and what theater can be and immerse myself inside of uh, an embedded understanding of my own uh, queerness and identity and affinity and the beauty of language. Um, fast forward, I'm given an opportunity to direct spell number seven at Princeton University. And I am discovering the idea of languaging and history of how to make a work and build a work, how to even liberate voices inside of a work because I can bring a particular presence to it. And I started doing my own kind of dramaturgical uh, version of it by taking other poems from Nappy Edges and really reverting back to the gender dynamics of, you know, femme voice over a mass voice and really creating a whole new kind of understanding of the work. Um, and. I was brought there by Ruth Simmons, who was a provost at Princeton at that time, who was demanding that there would be a black theater project inside of the uh, theater department that I had graduated from years before. Um, and they happened to, she happened to be good friends with Intozaki's parents. And so they came to see this production, this college production of Spell Number no. 7, and just immediately adopted me for some reason just said, this is the best production of Spell Number 7 we've ever seen. Uh, that from the parents. Um, and fast forward, I'm at Crossroads Theater with my good friend Judy Abalali, who's there inside of that place. And they have the opportunity of developing the work Love Space Demands uh, with Zaki. And they are interested. We've launched this new program called Genesis, a new play festival. And we're going to develop the work inside of that. I have been writing and developing my own kind of ritualized understanding of all of this embracement um, so that I had been selected to potentially be the director. Um, but there had to be a courtship. So we traveled down to Philadelphia to meet with Ntozaki and have dinner and to talk about this possible idea. And, you know, I'm nervous as hell and I'm sitting next to Zaki and we're having this conversation. And then she leans over to me and whispers in my ear, my parents love you. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, so from there I'm sort of ushered into this possibility 
And that created that first relationship and collaboration. And truly my first immersion and training ground working with Mickey Davison, which of course brings in Diane McIntyre and William Spaceman Patterson and this whole idea of embodied poetry and voice and music and dance. And um, then that leads to the introduction to Sekou Sundiata, who comes and sees the work and then is thinking about the next phase of mystery of love. And so then I become embedded inside of that. And then that leads me to working with Marlies Yearby and collaborating with Carl Hancock Rux and then Grisha Coleman and then back to Sekou and Craig, all from this, I feel, origin moment of meeting parents mm -hmm who usher in this, I'm just gonna say it, blessing that connected to a practice that I had been involved in and didn't fully have the language for and maybe still do not have the language for, but have become this practitioner to this day. Um, so there's an origin story that begins to build the vocabulary. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I would love to have a story of love in the way that those two stories are stories of love. But hearing, you know, receiving from Dr. Page the prompt a few days ago, the story I cannot stop thinking about is actually a story of fear. Uh, there's a setup. The line, there's a line in one of Omi's books that refers to the necessity for theatrical jazz practice opening one's intuitive powers. And that is utterly true. But also, it is the thing that I walked in the door with. The, the intuition is like a broken faucet. I cannot turn it off. <laughs> and so going into the workshop that is the location of the story that won't, that it won't go away, uh, it was at Hyde Park Theater. It was among the Frontera Company and friends of the Frontera Company. Laurie was leading it. And while the guiding principle of my life has been, I am scared by that thing, therefore I must do it. So I was there, but I was afraid because I knew I would be seen. The, the, the kind of the core reality that you bring yourself, yourself is required. There is no hiding behind character or technique, though technique is expected. Uh, but one of those folks had said, please come. And just as you know, I'm here on this stage today and also still scared, <laughs> that those folks say, will you come do this? And the answer is yes, without any requirement for the definition of this. Right. Will you come be part of this conversation? Will you come be part of this workshop? Will you come mow my lawn? Will you do this? You will do this. So we were in this workshop, and I was trying to deliver what was being asked for and simultaneously not be seen, which doesn't work. And so there was a moment where, after you know six hours of resistance and struggle and difficulty, we were given the responsibility to go take a walk. We were leaving Hyde Park Theater. We were, gonna, we were told to go walk for 30 minutes or something like that. And then we were to go join Lori. And somebody said, where? And she said, oh, you'll find me. <laughs> so at that period of time, Sharon, you're a character in most of these stories. Do you mind if I use you again? <laughs> <laughs> Sharon had a, an, like a broken foot or an injured ankle and was using crutches. And at that moment, when we were told, you gotta go take a walk, Sharon was across the room from her crutches. So I grabbed the crutches and took them over to her. And as we were leaving the building, Lori kind of from behind me said, okay, you're gonna be fine. When we, you know, and we walked and we ultimately did find Lori. She had chosen to locate herself at the place where she was staying and trusted that those who needed to figure out it out would figure it out. And so we were sitting and eating, back to the, the tail of the meal. And the other thing she said was, you're so damn clear. And it's been probably almost 30 years since she said that I still hear her voice. Because at that moment, I recognized 
that doesn't need to be a compliment and it doesn't need to be a criticism, but it's now something I am responsible for. That I, if I cannot not be so damn clear, then I need to use it in service of whatever I do. So to kind of wrap it back to the expansive definition of dramaturgy, the definition I work with now is that it is my opportunity and responsibility to try to make sure that everyone who is making the art has not just what they need and not just what they know they need, but everything that would potentially help the making of the art and the resulting work to be as exceptional, as bountiful, as joyful in the making, and as multi-meaningful as it can be, and then also to equip the receiving community with what they need to do their part of the work. And I think that's so damn clear helped with that. Thank you each and every one of you for those offerings. Before I open the conversation up, I actually would love to hear, um, do you all have any questions or responses to each other? I started to hear a little bit of connecting across the stories, but I'm wondering if anybody would like to respond to something they've heard before we throw things open to does anyone, or anything I haven't touched on that you'd like to share. Well, the, the one thing that I wanted to acknowledge that I'm definitely hearing um, from Megan is this, is the importance of the place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not the room where, the place where it happens, this idea that there are these special um, developmental um, for lack of a better word, uh, organizations, curatorial practice, where we all have lived mm -hmm. and have engaged in this work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've always sort of ad admired and wanted to be at uh, High Frontier, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like this place seems like such a place for me and sort of a home. Um, and the one that I wanted to put forward was the, uh, the series by Laura Greer, New Voices, New Visions, sort of at Aaron Davis Hall, which is such, when I look back to it, and I did have to bring, you know, some of my archival places, yes. but there's this one that I just sort of love to share, and it was from a concert I directed of the Tongues of Fire Choir, and it uh, has Sekou and Jessica Hagedorn and Zaki and Quincy Troop and Miguel Aguilin. Uh, Nona yeah. Hendricks was a part of it. Craig was a part of it. And just the idea of, of, of looking and thinking about sort of the dramaturgy inside of the curatorial practice mm -hmm. and the places where it happens and the importance of invoking those names as well mm -hmm. because they are, they are the homes mm -hmm. um, that helped to be the cauldron for the ongoing engagement of the work itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so continuing to hear sort of the, how all of this works together and the collective alignment of mm -hmm. sort of different artists inside of these unique places and the unique curators mm -hmm. who are also a part of supporting the development of the work. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the matter of invoking, mm -hmm. I wanted to just Absolutely. put that forth. Absolutely. You know. And New World Theater, where you served as the interim artistic director, and we met there, bringing Lori Carlos, bringing Sekou Sundiata, bringing Ping Chong. These were folks that I respected and admired from afar, and then was able to, um, you, you brought me in so that I could participate as a dramaturg, as a researcher, as a support person. So New World Theater in Amherst, Massachusetts is another place, really wonderful place, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I, I was just thanking beloved divine Dr. Omi Oshun um, before this session started for the books, you know, like for the book, Theatrical Jazz, Ashe and the Power of the Present Moment, and also really the Austin Project and then not having it be something that only those who participated in it could access because of creating experiments in a jazz aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, and I brought you in it too, Ebony, cause you know, cause you're my sister. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, we didn't live in Austin. 
we didn't live in Minneapolis. Like we like we we didn't get to we didn't get that. But then now I'm saying maybe I'm not contradicting myself because those those texts and the portable ceremony of it being able to be something that can be transmitted and for it to be something Ebony and I can require people to read before they get to collaborate with us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it, it, it was really huge in the possibility of this being intergenerational mm -hmm. in the way that it, it must be, in the, way that, in the way that holds the possibility of liberation for infinite generations, actually. Mm. And there is something so important about place. And so I do think about the fact that it's so important to me that Priscilla Hale decided that at all go, they were gonna always get this arts money in August, bring artists and residents to come in the hottest, most uncomfortable possible time to be in Austin <laughs> to like save our lives. And so Shango Dari, my partner Shango Dari and I, Mobile Homecoming, our first ever artist in residency was at all go through that program. And Priscilla was just like, whatever you want, whatever you wanna do. Mm. And that was very overwhelming to us because whatever we want. Um, and then we just kept coming back every every August um, until you know until that programming shifted. And I do think about that as something like an initiation. Mm. Like I did have to come sweat. And in this place that even even um, the the alchemy of art as public health, as community building, that is the legacy of Algo, to really um, physically hold the embodiment of that feels really important. And then I think about the fact that coming here, and of course it was Black or the Berry that seduced me into coming here, um, but I remember we stayed in Janata Petrus's house in, in her apartment when we were looking for like, where are we gonna live and how are we gonna do this? And the first night that we were in Janata's bed, cause she was in, off in Europe, I had this dream. And in this dream, one of my mentors, Naya Watkins, um, it was like there was a fire, there were there was jars of dirt. It was a very, very vivid dream, and it was it was it felt different to me than the dreams I usually have. And she said to me, You can what did she say? She said, You can still give people gifts after they've passed. And I woke up like, what? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Janata, what? <laughs> what is happening in this room? And, but then we went outside to the front steps and we saw on the mailbox, Lori Carlos. And I was like, Janata, what? Where do you, is this Lori Carlos? Is like, what, what is the story of this? And she said, you know, at the very end of her life, Lori Carlos lived in the upstairs of this same building, like, above where Janata's apartment was. And this is where the people sent gifts. This is where people sent the gifts. And so, and people are still sending gifts. That's why her name is still on the mailbox. And I was like, what? And so the first things that, um, thanks to Monkwe, who so welcomed me and was like, oh, you're gonna be here, and Janata for welcoming me and being like, well, here are the people. The first um, months that we were here, it was all Lori Carlos Oracle all the time. I mean, you were so generous to participate. And it was a listening for how this community holds the work, the methodologies, the memory, the love, the complexity of Lori Carlos. Um, that's how I got to have tea with Beverly Cotman. Mm. Oh, beloved, beloved Beverly Cotman. Mm. Um, 
and just listen and listen and listen and listen. And then here, here at, the, at this university, have a, a circle where people could Im embody how they hold the oracle of Lori Carlos's presence. And so all of that is to say, I'm just saying, yes, place is really important. Mm -hmm. And I feel very committed also as a writer of books and a encourager of people to publish and a, you know, a, a person who um, works in that form that we must have our, we, that's part of the archive, that's part of the portability, that's part of the accessibility and the inclusivity. And also, I think that we might want to think about pilgrimage, you know, mm -hmm. as part of how theatrical jazz, a jazz aesthetic, or however it is that we name this ongoing intergenerational love stream, mm -hmm. how it functions. It, it does function through place. Mm -hmm. And I'll say the importance of books as place. We now have a new home because of this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you want to? You're good. So this is a wonderful moment to um, move out into the audience and to hear from you all if you have questions. I believe because this is live stream, we would ask that you come up to one of the mics that's here. And um, I believe that will help with the streaming and the recording of this. So um, the floor is open. And we'd love to hear questions, responses, um, what, what is resonating with you, what are you sitting with? And I'm gonna take a couple of nice deep breaths because of this, the power of what we've all just been talking about to mark this transition. Hi. Hi. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. I'm a Get a little closer, there you go. Yes. Hi, my name is Gethsemane Heron. I'm a McKnight Fellow um, in playwriting here at the Playwright Center. Um, it's lovely to see you again, Megan, uh, and to see, meet you all. And I just wanted to respond to this idea about books as place. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a whole lot of like bibliotherapy for the past like, year or two, just staying in the land of books, and it has awakened in me mm. this huge desire to write a book. And yes. um, for, um, for everybody in the room who's written a book um, or is producing books, like how would you encourage theater makers, or in my case, just a little playwright, mm -hmm. to start generating into books and text and making places like outside of the stage. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about the talking bones. I was thinking about books as nourishment mm -hmm. and that moment I love. Um, I watched in the archives um, yeah, Daniel Alexander Jones in that production, Lori Carlos in that in that production, Lori Carlos saying, saying, "Oh, you must be starving. Mm. Baby, can I get you something to read?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, yes, 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 yes." So I think about that too, like books as medicine, books as shelter, books as food. You know, like the, that's um, what my teacher Zelda Lockhart also taught me, she said, your work will be food, medicine, and shelter to someone mm -hmm. and show up for it accordingly. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I'm thinking about. But um, I would say, like if you were personally coming to me for advice, I would say you should have a consultation with Sharon Bridgeforth <laughs> 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 about what, what it is to put um, what you are bringing through onto a page I would say it's so great, you know, that we have Kate from 53rd State Press here, you know, like that, that, they're, that, that this is like, you're in the right place. Um, and then I would just say there's your own process of, and our own process of meditating on, it's still a ceremony. And it travels differently. And it's even more like beyond your ability to control it 
then even if your plays are being produced in places that you're not physically there, it's like, it's like exponentially that. Because you don't know anything. You know, like, the, the, like people, are they gonna be in their bathtub? Are they gonna be on the subway? Like, you don't know what, where people gonna bring this book. It, it's so portable, and that's a, that's a, that's a really great thing. And for me, in, in the portable ceremonies that I create in my own books, I think about, therefore, however, mm. my responsibility for the ceremony to be what the ceremony is, knowing I have no idea the conditions under which people will be accessing it. And so I have to really, really listen. And I, with my own work, I read it out loud again and is it, does it sound right? Is it the, and, and what I've found is that when I, you know, randomly on Instagram or, you know, in, in, on YouTube and in other settings, when I hear people reading from my work, it sounds like what I heard. Mm -hmm. And that's the measure. That means, like, I'm like, okay, I did it then. Mm -hmm. Because they were able to be in the ceremony that, um, that I was in. We were able to be in the same ceremony, even though they don't know me, they don't know what I sound like, they don't know when I breathe, they, you know. None of that. So um, Jola was talking earlier about that really, really deep listening. It becomes then a reflexive listening to yourself. What are the things that, without having the, this is the setting, or this is the, you know, like what, what are those things that even though you in some ways surrender that because you give people the freedom to engage your work textually wherever they are, what are the things that therefore need to be there for them? Yeah. That's, that's what I would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'll wait. I, what I quickly wanted to say was just the, um, the, the importance of these books and publishing to the sense of dramaturgical practice inside of this idea uh, of the jazz aesthetic um, in, in knowing that what you have collected are, are these case studies in many ways and sort of the understanding of the practice itself. You know, I was so thrilled to see No Black Male Show inside of experiments in jazz aesthetic, sort of that it, it holds a place inside of the understanding of the possibility and the practice and the idea that these things, these works were happening at the same time in different places really begins um, our foundational understanding of how to talk about the, the idea and the languaging itself. So everyone, all of you, inside of that idea of just documenting the work that has been done um, is such a gift in really thinking about how we um, share our language inside of the idea of practice and what is, what is held just by recognizing the work itself and having it as a way to share it. So please add to that contribution. Mm -hmm. yes. And in that same spirit, get somebody, it's wonderful to see you again too, thank you. Uh, there are people who are waiting for your book, so don't be afraid. Take your time, but don't stop for long. Yeah, and I would also love to build on, Alexis, what you were offering about the portability of books and the unpredictability of the circumstances under which a book and a reader will connect. And I find that to be dramaturgically true for performance events as well. That the community that arrives to experience an event is in an uncontrollable state of whateverness. <laughs> there's, you know, there's no way to know or predict what day or what year or what lifetime they will have had before arriving for this moment. So there is such an opportunity to offer water, to offer food, to offer aroma, to offer music, to offer all the, you know, I'm going back to something Zell mentioned in the previous round table about using all five senses. And I think there's a dramaturgical approach of, of engaging the senses to assist each audience member in adjusting and being welcomed into the best posture to then engage with the performance or the ceremony that they're there to be a part of. But that moment tends to be brief and extremely unique to the individual. So it's, again, intuitive work, but it's also thoughtful, careful awareness of 
for the first minute and a half of the performance, ideally the audience will be ready for this. this. How, I mean, what will they need? What will they need to have just been given? What will they have needed to pass through without awareness of the way that it was going to become useful to them? So that then they're with you for those first moments. And then beyond that, the performance or the ceremony can be trusted to bring them along. Uh, so as you know, I've, I've departed from the book question and related it back to the, the sort of expansive definition of dramaturgy, but I appreciate the invitation into it. I mean, one of the best dramaturgical lessons that I learned was an effort in trying to make a script, a script for Love Space Demands. And this idea of, you know, I made the terrible mistake of thinking that it's a play mm -hmm. and that it's gonna be structured like mm -hmm. a play. And Zaki pulled me aside and said, I don't mind if you reorder the poems. I don't mind if they're restructured and renamed. But the thing that you must do is you must preserve the landscape and the layout of the words as I have written them. Mm. You cannot reframe them, restructure them. You can't put them in another form because the way I have placed the words on the page is the way I hear it and I want to hear it. Mm. And it was just that wonderful kind of mm -hmm. reminder of the importance of languaging yeah. inside of that process and the practice and that the visual aspect of a text mm -hmm. uh, is in this work um, is, is, is just as invaluable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Another question, yes. Uh, not a question, no reflection. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you all for your share. I want to take this because I feel like I should be sitting down. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be standing. Okay. I'm like, I want to offer flowers to all of you, um, and thank you so much for the share. And um, one of the reflections that I want to offer is just, I was literally having a conversation with Ananya outside the door about practice. And then to hear it echoed so much inside of here, practice methodology, the embodiment, the documentation of it. Um, uh, I, 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 it was... Um, hearing the interconnectedness of um, what's present and what's necessary um, in terms of what we're holding, what we're archiving, and what we're creating spaces for. Um, and I am so certain that you know this, but I also want to reflect, um, you named it um, in, in terms of dramaturgy, how you're creating this environment, you're creating this, this uh, not your words, but stew of experience from which the makers draw from, from what the participants draw, uh, audience participants draw from. But it's also, as a practitioner, it's the methodology. Mm -hmm. So I also just want to, you know, to really celebrate. I've had the uh, honor, privilege, swell of experience of working with Talvin for now over a decade to cross paths with Sharon, with Melanie, and, you know, just so many people who, because of the practices you hold, this is now the methodology that I hold. I'm in your constellation, you just don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. And, um, and, and just so, the, you know, there's the things that happen on the stage, there's the things that happen on the audience, but then there's the thing that builds up the practice that continues things that we worked on from this piece become the body of knowing that I share for the next piece or I share with my students. And so just really celebrating the work of dramaturgy in terms of how you are swelling the know-how in addition to the evoking of names, the invoking of ancestry and lineage, the archiving, but to build, building the, the, the practice in the, 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 the modules of how we put it in the body, how we take it out the mind, how we, you know, how we put it here underneath, inside, um, that that's, that this process has been uh, um, so um, uh, something. The word I'm looking for is like the thing that you can't do without, you know, in terms of um, um, of, 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 of really grounding in that know-how. So just wanted to celebrate that about the work that you all do, and specifically because I have the mic to shout out the folks who have been part of my swell inside of the room. Beautiful. Thank you. That's our Bunch of women. Yes, 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 yes. Right, and the incredible dramaturg that you have become inside of your artistry and sharing, Shannon, and building, especially in building Hate Blue. 
was mm -hmm. quite remarkable to witness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Other reflections, comments, questions from our participants or from our panelists? Yes. Um, sort of a, not a question so much as a observation that maybe I would love some additional insight on. Um, as Shannon was talking, I was thinking about, um, I used to be an in-house dramaturg for dance mm -hmm. um, for an organization called Lumberyard, which no longer exists. But uh, I remember in a process, they had their, a particular project had their own dramaturg, and I was sort of like the in-house dramaturg supporting whatever else needed supported. And there was mm -hmm. this contentious relationship between this white dance theater artist and the dramaturg that came with their project. And it was, mm -hmm. the thing I observed was there was this clear splinter between the person who was the maker and this person who was considered a, who was identified as a dramaturg as um, support system to the project. And one of the things I feel like I'm hearing as you all talk and as I reflect on the works that I've seen is that um, in this aesthetic that we're calling theatrical jazz, that gets sort of um, broken down that the dramaturg as contributor is also an artist mm -hmm. um, and not this clear like demarcation between dramaturg as the person who is like responsible for identifying what clothes you might have worn in 1926 yes, or whatever. Yes, yes. Um, dramaturg as generative mm -hmm. contributor to a process and because I sort of fell into dramaturgy, that's the only way I've ever worked and mm -hmm. didn't have any experience with that other thing. Um, and so I don't know, I just, it's just percolating mm -hmm. in my head mm -hmm. and I wanted to offer and, and maybe get some prompts mm -hmm. back. I'm Melanie, by the way. Yeah. Well, you know that I live in that space <laughs> of collaborative, generative dramaturg inside mm -hmm. of process and that for the most part is the invitation and the room that I seek out and the, the long-term, I mean, I think that's the whole point of it, the long-term uh, processing, sort of the long-term processing with Jowale, with Seku, with Bibi, with, you know, mm -hmm. that there's something about building a shared language and a vocabulary together and understanding a developmental process the idea of, of dramaturg being there day one mm -hmm. inside of sort of what we are sort of investigating, exploring, and discovering for me is, has always been the sort of the definition of practice and what I feel that I've always been invited into, mm -hmm. um, particularly because of that collective group of artists who in many ways directly connect to this understanding inside of these aesthetics that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. If I could just add, I think part of what I'm curious about hearing from you, Talvin, mm -hmm. is like, what's the jazziness? Uh -huh. <laughs> that thing, what it, like, like, right. Well, it's, you know, it's, uh, Sekou says, it's, I'm going to say it. It's right here. <laughs> I wrote it down. Yeah. I wanted to bring it. Yeah. So to say, who wrote it? He said, uh, where, where, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Uh, he says, this is poetry as living word. That's the tradition I come out of, the spoken word as celebration of life, as expression of consciousness through the power and glory of language. Poetry not as monologue, but as dialogue, a chant, a call, a response, a riff, a refrain, and a whatnot. You know, always remember that it's about these curses and these blessings. And so I pull that out because it's inside of that practice. It's, it's the expected sense of riff, of dialogue, of call and response, uh, that's the jazziness of, I feel, the dramaturgical practice inside of the jazz aesthetic. I would love to add just a, a like one and a half things to that. Um, I've seen that kind of splintering too and it can be very painful to be a witness to and not always easy to do anything about it. Um, but I think some of it is traceable to the sense of skin in the game that Trust is built when 
everyone is contributing to the effort at hand and no one is standing outside commenting on it. And that standing outside commenting is an older and to my mind less appealing form of dramaturgy, less contributory. Um, two of the other things I drew from rereading to, to come into this conversation were again from Omi's work. The group relies on you to take the solo when it is tossed your way and to hold them up during theirs. And it sounds to me like that failing to hold others up may have been part of the diagnosis that you were facing at that time. And the other is that the power of the group is directly related to the distinctiveness of each member. And it comes back to bring you, bring you into it. You standing outside of it is not helpful. I, I mm, yeah, yes. Um, the only thing I'll add is that my experience as a birth doula, which I'm also only a birth doula for specific people in my family. Mm -hmm. um, my family that I choose, I'm not like available on the internet to like, <laughs> be up with you all night. I'm not, um, and I'm not available on the internet as just a dramaturg for whoever. <laughs> like, you know, like that's that's um, that's important, and so it's it's a way. Yeah, it's a, it's a way of being in family, but it's it's also. I do think about being in the role of doula. I remember my sister said after giving birth to my first nephew, your breathing reminded me to breathe. Mm -hmm. She was like, thank you for the way you breathed with me. That's what helped me remember to breathe. And I, I hold that with me as a facilitator. I hold, I hold that with me in every area of my life. But I, I also think about the distinction for me, the way that I think about that work of, of being a birth doula with someone is it's, it's for the person giving birth to honor that they are in a process of transformation and creation. And more than it's for the person being born, hmm. right? Because it's different. Like a, a midwife is responsible, I think, primarily to the person being born of course, also to the person giving birth. But my understanding of what, what my doula role has been when I've been a doula is this, this is about that, that everything that can support that process of creation happening, that is what is called for. Mm -hmm. And it is, and, and you don't know what it's going to be. Like, every birth is different, right? And every production of every work of art is different. And I think that, I think that that's why humility and vulnerability is so important. But also, yeah, skin in the game. Like, also that, like, this is about, like, I'm going to be more free at the end of this process. Mm -hmm than I've ever been in my life. I can't even imagine it from here. That's why I'm here. I'm not just like curious about what gonna happen. You know, like, mm. <laughs> like that, that, that's, because if I was just curious about what was gonna happen, I'm not willing to do whatever it takes. You know, and I'm not willing to let go of the things that I think I'm really an expert in and move into things that I don't even know that I could do. You know, like I, I remember, um, yeah, just, I mean, the intuition is so important and being able to listen to, like, for, for Bull Jean. I remember, like, I went to the river and sang a song into my phone and sent it to Omi, you know? And I was like, but when I decided to say yes, I didn't know that that would be a thing that... Would, can I even sing? You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it really... Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity of this expansive version of dramaturgy to say, this is not about you proving who you already think you are or who the people thought you were when you got here and just like conforming to this particular role and trying to demand other people conform to something. 
it really is a beautiful form of surrender that honors the initial surrender, which is the creation of the work of art that is still in the process of being created. Mm. Um, and I, yeah, I feel, I feel really grateful. And I also just would like to make it clear, I would not participate in dramaturgy in any other mm. way. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I'm noticing that, that we are at time. So I'd love to give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> give yourselves a round of applause for being here. And thank you. I look forward to spending more time with everyone um, at this wonderful gathering. And um, I believe we are on a lunch break now. And um, things will pick up a little while in the afternoon. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>